Hello and welcome to Presley News Analysis. I'm Kavit Akhwai. The situation in Syria was supposed to be about Syrians demonstrating for reforms and change, but it is now far from that. After all, President Bashar al-Assad did deliver on those reforms, but that's not what the West wants and their allies. The situation instead has turned out into a proxy war involving several players such as the U.S., U.K., Turkey, not to mention fighters from different nationalities, including from Egypt, Libya, and Jordan. The meanwhile, German intelligence citing al-Qaeda's involvement and the money that is being provided by Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Well, some observers say Syria has become the scene of a small-scale world war. In this news analysis, we will discuss the different dynamics of this war and differentiate fact from fiction and ultimately weigh in whether this adventurism by the West and its allies will have deep repercussions for the region and possibly the world. Fighting rages on in Syria between Syrian government forces and foreign-backed armed groups. The focal point of the battle now is Aleppo, the country's largest city and commercial hub. Large numbers of armed men are set to be holed up in several neighborhoods of the city. The Syrian forces have already cleared Damascus of the armed groups, and they are fighting to eliminate the last pockets of resistance on the outskirts of the capital. As the clashes go on, a new report has emerged that reveals new dimensions of regional countries' involvement in the Syrian unrest. A source in Qatar says Turkey, along with the Persian Gulf countries of Saudi Arabia and Qatar, is sending weapons and communications equipment to Syrian armed groups from a secret base near Syria's border. The base is located in the southern Turkish city of Adana, some 100 kilometers from Syria's border. Meanwhile, the German Federal Intelligence Service, BND, has confirmed that Al-Qaeda is responsible for numerous terrorist attacks in Syria, including the massacre in Hula. The BND estimates that Al-Qaeda has carried out about 90 terrorist attacks in Syria between late last December and early July. There is the scenario that we saw in Afghanistan whereby the U.S. supported the Mujahideen against the Soviet invasion. Uh, the, the Mujahideen, uh, and namely the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, eventually used the weapons that the U.S. supplied to them, the CIA in particular, to use them against uh, and the expertise uh, of uh, that they were, the training that they received at the hands of the CIA to use eventually against the United States themselves. And of course, uh, the more uh, Al Qaeda gains ground in Syria, the more uh, they are likely to gain uh, to gain hold of, of uh, you know eventually if the situation become, becomes uh, more. Uh, uh, more severe, they might eventually get, gain hold of uh, certain arsenals. Large numbers of foreign extremists paid by Saudi Arabia and Qatar have entered Syria from Arab countries, including Jordan, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt and Libya, as well as faraway places like Chechnya. All this is happening under the nose of the U.S. and its key Western ally, Britain, who themselves are said to be providing armed groups with intelligence and training. This is while Washington and London claim to be at war with al-Qaeda and the group's offshoots. Uh, supposedly the war on terror that began on 9-11 was all about wiping out al-Qaeda. And yet here we have the American and British governments, who were the uh, two foremost uh, countries who were involved in the quote-unquote war on terror. And yet here they are funding, uh, training, and uh, arming uh, this uh, terrorist group uh, because it happens to serve their purposes and Israel's purposes in destabilizing uh, Syria. So I think that the, the real lesson to be learned from this is whenever the West starts uh, talking about fighting terrorism, uh, these are just empty words. Let's see what our guest thinks. Political commentator and broadcaster from The Ugly Truth, Mark Dankoff, joins us from San Antonio, Texas. And we have Middle East Affairs expert Patrick Seal, who joins us from Cannes. Gentlemen, welcome. I'd like to start with you, Patrick Seal. We have German intelligence that is saying Al-Qaeda is all over Syria, that around 90 terror attacks that can be attributed to Al-Qaeda, and that's between, fascinating, between the end of December and the beginning of July. And that's almost, what, seven months there. It's called U.S. proxy Al-Qaeda death squads in Syria. Your reaction? Well, there's no doubt that uh, the conflict has widened and that uh, the, the local uh, Islamist Muslim brothers have now got lots of allies from uh, outside, these jihadis you mentioned, or Salafis, armed Islamists, coming in, mainly from Iraq, but also from Lebanon, some from Jordan, and some, as you say, from further afield. This, of course, the hallmark of these people is suicide bombings, and there have been quite a few of those. 
whether the figure quoted by the German intelligence is correct or not. In any event, there are quite a lot of them, and they have, in a way, changed the nature of this conflict, because, as one of your other guests said a moment ago, it puts the United States and its allies in a rather embarrassing situation. They're fighting al-Qaeda in many, many countries, and here they seem to be on the same side of it. And so I think they're quite well aware of the difficulty of that position, and so they're trying to filter the weapons and funds and intelligence they're sending in, and trying, they're trying not to send them to these jihadi groups. But that's, of course, very, very difficult, because there are about 100 of these armed groups. It's very difficult to say which are, uh, which are Islamists, which are not, which are, which are simply armed peasants or unemployed youth, or which are these Salafi fighters. So it does put the West in a very, very difficult position. But what I think we're increasingly seeing is that the internal crisis in Syria is overshadowed, as you mentioned, I think, overshadowed by this regional conflict, a sort of mini Cold War between the United States and its allies on the one hand, and Russia, China, uh, Iran uh, on, on the other. Uh, who, who, of course, are, t are trying to protect the, the Syrian regime, which they feel is facing a, an external conspiracy. Mark Dankov, let's bring in Turkey, uh, which has been reported to set up a secret base, a nerve, uh, uh, what is called a nerve center of sorts, uh, with allies Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, Qatar to direct military and communications aid uh, to these uh, so-called fighters who are fighting the government from a city near the border do you agree that it's the Turks who are militarily controlling it with Qatar and Saudi Arabia at the bottom? Uh, probably. I mean, that's uh, probably for someone with more intelligence information than I have as to uh, exactly what the leading uh, military force is from the outside, probably Turkish. But I think the best explanation to us in the West as to what's really going on here comes from uh, Charlie Skelton's piece in the British Guardian on the Syrian opposition. He analyzes the connections of a number of these people connected with the so-called Syrian National Council, which claims to be the spokes uh, people for all of the opposition to President Assad. Uh, Skelton analyzes these people, uh, including someone by the name of Basma Kodmani, uh, kind of the uh, claimed head of the Syrian National Council. Uh, here is a person who is based in Paris. She's a French citizen. She attended the secretive Bilderberg Conference in Chantilly, Virginia, held here in the United States recently. Uh, she is someone who is the executive director of something called the Arab Reform Initiative, or ARI, which is the creation of something called the U.S. Middle East Project, which in turn is an operation being run by the Globalist Council on Foreign Relations, or CFR, right here in New York. She's directly connected to uh, General Brent Scrocoft, uh, to Henry Kissinger, to Zbigniew Brzezinski, to Lord Kerr of Royal Dutch Shell. She's tied up with George Soros. She's tied up with Peter Sutherland of Goldman Sachs. Uh, she's tied up with all of the usual suspects, which point in the direction of Zionism, international banking, oil consortiums, and arms dealers. And these are the folks who want to get rid of President Assad in Syria and pave the way for an American and Israeli military intervention against Iran. And, and one key way of doing that is to remove a key supporter of Iran in the Arab world uh, to exacerbate the s tensions between Sunni and Shiite Muslims and to basically undercut both Hezbollah in Lebanon and to remove a major supporter of Palestinian resistance against ongoing Israeli occupation. Uh, this is what's happening here, and uh, people like Anderson Cooper of CNN and Wolf Blitzer of CNN and these people being directed by Rupert Murdoch of Fox News are telling the American public none of this, and we're being led to believe that President Assad is just the, practically the worst leader in world history and that we have to get rid of him at all costs. And the stage is being set uh, for another version of what happened in Libya, with NATO and the United States and Israel and Britain being directly involved and again as a prelude to a wider war with Iran which is what Netanyahu wants 
It's what the oil companies want, it's what the banks want, and it's what the arms dealers want. And the Syrian National Council people are working hand in glove with Israel, with the uh, Sunni Gulf states, including Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. They're working with Turkey, and ironically enough, they're working with al-Qaeda, too. And that is ironic, isn't it, uh, Patrick Seal? But uh, let, let's uh, uh, expand more about Turkey here. Uh, I'd like to find out from you uh, that Turkey's uh, President Erdogan uh, came up with a warning, and it said that he may take action against the Kurdish rebels operating in the north of uh, Syria. Uh, do you think that this is going to lead to a uh, perhaps Turkish and NATO uh, intervention into Syria? I personally don't think so. Uh, there isn't really any appetite, either in Turkey or in any of the Western countries, and certainly not in the United States, to get physically involved in the conflict inside Syria, to put boots on the ground. Nobody wants that. What they're trying to do is beef up the, the rebels, uh, beef up the Free Syrian Army, so-called, with, of course, all these jihadis attached to it. Now, as I said earlier, this puts them in a rather embarrassing situation. But there's no doubt that the final goal, the ob objective, is to bring down the whole so-called resistance axis of Iran, Syria, and Hezbollah. I mean, what the United States would really like to do is to bring down the two regimes in Tehran and Damascus. And this, of course, is what the Israelis are pushing them to do. Just as they pushed them to destroy Iraq, so they would like to push them to destroy Iran. And of course, if they can bring down the Syrian regime first, they feel this would sever Iran's links with the Levant, with the Palestinians, with Hezbollah in particular. The Israelis have tried to destroy Hezbollah in 2006. They tried to destroy Hamas in 2008 and 9. They failed on both counts. Now they see a chance to bring down that whole, that whole axis. But without, without actually getting involved themselves, this is the paradox. That's why they're trying to strengthen the rebels, providing them with intelligence, with communications equipment, with weapons, and trying to get them more organized than they have been in the past. Because a feature of the present situation is, of course, the, the great divisions. In the, uh, in the opposition. I mean, one of your speakers a moment ago mentioned Basma Kudmani. But of course, she's a million miles away from these Salafists. She's a completely different personality. Her aims are different. But of course, her organization, the Syrian National Council, has provided cover for these rather more violent elements. And this is her dilemma as well. The fundamentals of the situation have not really changed, in my view. First of all, I think the regime uh, retains the political uh, uh, supremacy in a way. The balance of power is still very much, military balance of power is still very much in the regime's favor. Secondly, Syria continues to enjoy the protection of Russia and China at the Security Council. Thirdly, I think, as I said, there's no appetite anywhere in the West after these many wars in, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, with, with the economic cuts and, uh, and troop cuts in countries like, like uh, Britain and France, there's no appetite for an intervention. And fourthly, of course, the opposition, as I say, is divided. They haven't united behind a single leader. They haven't provided a clear uh, political program. And they are being overshadowed now by the Muslim Brothers in, in Syria, which is the strongest element in the opposition, together with these Salafi allies of it. So, 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 so this is the rather, this is the difficult situation in, in, in which the, the opponents of the Syrian regime and of Iran find themselves. Right. Well, let me bring in Kevin Barrett. He's an author uh, and Islamic studies expert who joins us from Madison. Kevin Barrett. Our guest there uh, from Cannes, Patrick uh, Seal, talked about the divided opposition. At the same time, we know the different elements that are involved in this so-called uh, fighters on the ground, which uh, have uh, been cited to be of different nationalities, including Libya, Egypt, and Jordan. Uh, not to have a strong grip on that either. These Western countries, such as the U.S., U.K., and France, for example, 
uh, being funded uh, by Turkey, uh, I'm sorry, by Qatar and Saudi Arabia, and of course Turkey being the training ground. Uh, let's reflect on Russian President Putin, who has said if the Syrian leadership is ousted from power by unconstitutional means, the leadership and the opposition will trade places, and this war is going to continue. So how is this situation even remotely under the control of these countries who are involved in it? Are you asking me that? No, this is for Kevin Barrett. Well, the situation is really not in, in very good control. <laughs> Yes, well, it's an honor, actually, to be on the same show with uh, Patrick Seal, one of my uh, favorite Mideast experts. I've been reading him since graduate school. Uh, and I, uh, I appreciate particularly that Patrick has been so honest about the fact that false flag terrorism is an important element, especially in Israeli Middle East strategy. But and what he just said about the incongruity of al-Qaeda and the Western globalists and Zionists sort of working on the same team in Syria to destabilize the Syrian government. Uh, I think it's not as incongruous as it looks at first glance. If you accept the official Western narrative that al-Qaeda is indeed an autonomous, radical Islamic group that just sort of appeared out of nowhere and you know, turned against the U.S. after a brief alliance in Afghanistan and so on, then it would seem incongruous. But I, I believe that al-Qaeda is more or less a, an invention of the Western intelligence services. Bernard Lewis has devoted much of his career to the idea that the West ought to create a modern ver version of the Ismaili assassins who destabilized the Middle East during the Middle Ages, the time of the Crusades. And I think that's what al-Qaeda really is. Uh, it was created uh, with the help of the U.S. intelligence services and their proxies in Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. And I think it's always been a proxy of the U.S. intelligence services, including when it falsely accepted the blame for 9-11, which was a military intelligence operation carried out by the U.S. and Israel. Uh, so it's not at all surprising that so-called al-Qaeda is in Syria doing the bidding of the Western imperialists and globalists and Zionists. That's th what they do. That's their job. And certainly the foot soldiers on the ground are not aware of this. But some of the leadership is. Al-Qaeda leaders have been arrested uh, in places like Turkey and in jail. They, uh, they're not fasting during Ramadan. Uh, they, they want alcohol. The jailers ask, well, what's, what's going on? We thought you were radical Islamists. And these guys say, oh, no, we're just working on part of a, strat a strategy of tension. Strategy of tension, of course, being a euphemism for false flag terrorism sponsored by these Western governments uh, sponsoring attacks on themselves. So that leads us to your question about what's the end game of all of this? Where can it possibly go? I think that the only end game in Syria is perpetual civil war. And Syria uh, looks like it could fragment into all of these different sectarian uh, and confessional communities. And that's exactly what the Zionists and the imperialists want. So by fomenting this unrest in Syria, what they're really doing is intentionally uh, destroying Syria in the same way that they largely destroyed Iraq. And they're taking it out of the equation as an opponent of Zionism and imperialism. And as Patrick Seale said, uh, they want to take out this whole axis of resistance of Syria, uh, Iran, and Hezbollah. Mark Dankov, so am I to understand our guest Kevin Barrett correctly, uh, this mayhem that is causing with the different uh, groups involved on the ground fighting the government from different uh, ethnicities and nationalities is going to lead to a fragmented Syria to break up into pieces. Is that what you foresee? Uh, yes, and I think Kevin has this exactly correctly, uh, down to the last jot and tittle. And, uh, what and I, I think as you look at this whole situation, that uh, clear... Go ahead, Mark. No, I think uh, Patrick, uh, or uh, Kevin Barrett has this down exactly correctly, uh, that this is uh, the, the, the fact about al-Qaeda, that uh, the Bernard Lewis strategy of uh, carving up Syria uh, and the entire Middle East, for that matter, uh, for Israel and all of the other usual suspects is what's going on. And the ultimate irony here uh, needs to be underscored as well for the American public and the European public, as well as for all of the innocent people of the Middle East, including those in Syria and Iran who are being victimized by this. Uh, I will quote da uh, Dr. Alan Sabrosky, uh the Director of Strategic Studies for the United States National War College. 9-11 
9-11 was an Israeli Mossad operation from start to finish, period, he says, quote unquote. Kevin underscores that, and so what you have is a situation here where all of these false flag operations just since 2001 are achieving everything that the usual suspects want in Syria and elsewhere. I cited these at the beginning of my portion of this conversation. You're looking at Zionism, international bankers, arms merchants, and oil consortiums, and all of these uh, red herrings like Al-Qaeda, quote unquote, uh, quote unquote, are being very skillfully manipulated in the American media. And talk about the media, Patrick Seal. We know there's been a media war. We know there's been uh, false uh, uh, facts coming from different organizations media-wise, whether it's the BBC even, and of course Al Arabiya uh, and Al Jazeera. Uh, so, so tell us uh, what scenario is going to unfold, uh, because time is not on the side of all these countries uh, that are involved. And uh, some are saying that this battle in Aleppo is going to be a huge turning point. But that's what was said about Damascus. If the fighters on the ground lose that battle and get flushed out, uh, uh, what's going to happen next? Well, I think before I answer your question, I should say that I think we have to be a bit careful with conspiracy theories. And, and uh, the whole idea that, uh, that the Israelis did 9-11 that Al-Qaeda is really run by Western intelligence services. I think that needs a little bit of more nuance. You see, there's no question that, of course, when the United States, with its local allies, mobilized tens of thousands of young Arabs to fight the Russians, Soviets, in Afghanistan, that was really what, what, what started this whole, this whole phenomenon. Because when the Russians pulled out of Afghanistan in 89, the Americans simply then just simply dropped the Mujahideen, these fighters whom they had mobilized, trained and armed. And of course this created a large group of young men who couldn't go home, or didn't, uh, the, the, the home come, countries didn't want them. And they created mayhem. They, 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 in fact, people started calling them Afghan Arabs. And, 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 and of course uh, Osama bin Laden mobilized some of them, and that's how the organization uh, started. Now, of course, it, it had a grievance against Saudi Arabia, for, because Saudi Arabia gave a home to half a million Americans who kick Iraq out of Kuwait. It, it had a grievance against America for dropping them, and, and of course, it's been at war, really, with the United States ever since. So I think it may be a little bit far-fetched to say that it's purely a creature today, of Western intelligence services. Don't agree with that. Now, the, the battle in, in, on the ground in, in, in Syria, the, the regime has more or less won the battle in Damascus. The front has now shifted to Aleppo. Um, of course, a, a conventional army such as Syria's, Syria has got, a large conventional army trained actually to fight Israel. It, it doesn't have an easy time fighting an urban guerrilla war. But it's now mobilizing a lot of troops, sending the reinforcements there, using heavy weapons, including its air force. And I think there's no doubt that in a few days it will manage to crush uh, those pockets of rebellion. I think one has to note, note the, two, the two respective strategies. On the one hand, the regime strategy is to try and eliminate and crush any pockets of rebellion armed rebellion on Syrian soil. Even when they hole up in residential areas, then they use their heavy weapons against them. The, the opposition strategy... Okay, uh, I'm sorry, i got to cut you short. I do apologize. Patrick Seeler, thank you so much. I'd like to also thank Kevin Barrett, and we had Mark Dankoff also uh, talking to us. Thank you all. And thank you, the viewer, for watching thank another you. edition of the Press TV News Analysis from Ikawa Tatwe and the entire you. team in the capital of Tehran. It's goodbye.